listening to the Web3 Prof Podcast. Good morning and good afternoon, everyone. I'm here with Jeff Booth, who is the author of The Price of Tomorrow, which is an incredible book. Um, also, um, the general partner or a general partner at uh, Ego Death Capital. Um, entrepreneur, uh, this guy has done and is doing a lot of amazing things. Jeff, I really appreciate you being with me here today. Yeah, thanks for having me. So we got a lot to talk about today. Um, and and uh, it's really all going to be centered around uh, Bitcoin and, uh, and maybe kind of like the macro of what's happening or what's going to happen um, in the world today. But before we get into that, maybe you can just tell us a little bit about like your background. Who are you? Where did you come from? Entrepreneurship, author, um, uh, board member, you do a lot of things. Um, and so give us a little bit of a, a, a rundown. Uh, just, I would say that the highest level is entrepreneur looking at problems and to try to solve those problems. Mm. And, and so I've always done that, yeah. uh, that, and typically using technology to solve those problems mm -hmm. and then came to the realization that technology was moving really fast. It was exponential yeah, and that should be solving a whole bunch of problems around the world. Yeah. Um, and the biggest problem at all of all was that technology that was supposed to make our lives better was, was, was up against a system that had to inflate, uh, had to drive inflation to pay yeah. back a system. So, so I wrote the book in response to kind of being a technology entrepreneur and seeing what's happening in technology and realizing that the, the abundance gained from technology couldn't be broadly distributed to society right. in the system we were in. Okay. Excellent. That's fascinating. Okay. So, um, when we look at economics today, we see massive inflation, which yep. is, which, uh, which may be. Maybe eight months ago, people, a lot of people didn't even know what that was, but now it's like a buzzword yeah. and everybody is constantly talking about inflation, inflation, inflation. So why um, are we in a scenario where inflation is happening so rapidly, not just here in Canada, but all over the world? Um, we live in a system, a debt-based system or a credit-based system that only works if credit expands. Mm -hmm. And so, so, and, and so technology, we have two systems, one that we live in that is that if the credit contracts, you would have a deflationary depression and the credit underlying the system would reset. Mm -hmm. So there's, call it $300 trillion of debt in the world. It's actually a lot higher than that if you look at underfund, un, unfunded liabilities, mm -hmm. but $300 trillion of debt in the world and technology that's bit trying to make things cheaper. Mm -hmm. And so your phone, or your calculator on your phone, they're all free, right? Mm -hmm. your, your you you take millions of photos today mm -hmm. and they're free. Mm -hmm. And so that abundance wants to be able to, uh, uh, that abundance created by technology wants to drop price. And, but this system, if prices fell, the system would reset and every bank would fail and everything would fail. Right. So we put up with a system, we live in a system that inflation is wage deflation. So our way, our real wages are going down mm -hmm. as we, as we try to, on, uh, on a hamster wheel, move faster and faster in a system that's moving further and further away from right. us. So, so, and that, uh, that inflation is all caused by manipulation of money. So in a free market, prices would continue to fall, fall forever. So as productivity increased, product, that productivity in the form of lower prices would flow to society. Mm -hmm. In the system we're in, that can't happen. Right that productivity increase must flow to very few people at the top. Right. And then because inflation is wage deflation or savings deflation, a whole bunch of people are left out of that mm -hmm. and they're getting more and more mad right. when the food prices are going up, mm. the house prices or the rental prices are, uh, 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 are going up and they're reaching to government to solve that problem. And government is printing more money yeah. to solve the problem, making the problem worse. Yeah. But there is no way out from the existing system when when typically systems get like this and and cur currencies reset through time mm -hmm. and, and failure of the roman empire was very similar mm -hmm. failure of currencies is very similar throughout time typically what ends up happening is you go to war to reset them mm. and the winner of the war resets the currency and says Jeez. promise we won't do it again so that is that's why the world feels more and more dangerous right from the existing system and every single thing that everybody's doing within it 
trying to make more money within it is actually strengthening that system. Okay. So, so, so all of us who are trying to get raises or start businesses to support ourselves or to solve a problem are actually making the problem worse. And exactly, exactly. Because, because what do we do as humans? We try to solve problems and Mm -hmm. and today we can solve those problems with technology and those problems remove labor. Right. Right. So we used to build roads with a shovel. Now we will build with the machine. When we use a machine, it gets more efficient to build a road um, and the labor falls as a result. And that that abundance that gained in time savings should flow to society. Right. In our existing system, it can't. I heard Milton Friedman talk about um, this idea where, you know, I'm trying to sell a product and I'm trying to get people to pay more and more for my product so I can make more money. Uh, which at the same time is costing everybody more and more money, which forces them to make more and more money. And everybody is fundamentally just kind of on this hamster wheel going nowhere. Where, all, uh, you know, at the end of the day, we're no farther ahead. All we're doing is paying more for stuff that uh, with the, maybe the, the inflated wages we have. Yeah, so people uh, people were working two jobs or working harder and harder and harder. What they're really fa- scared of is they're scared of failing. Mm. and not having enough money to feed their families Mm -hmm. right that's what they're the the fear and it's it's a real fear in the existing system because prices are moving up everywhere right but those prices are manipulated to move up right essentially you're you're, we all agree with this uh uh, this tenant that says it's okay for governments to manipulate money so that we work harder forever right that's what that's that's what the world looks like to uh today we we Nobody even questions that a productive society can exist without inflation. Mm. People people believe inflation is required for a productive society. So now dig a little deeper on what that says. It it says, it's okay to steal your money, to make your money worth less, Mm -hmm. to be able to live in a productive society. And if if the emergent complex behavior of society, all of us trading with each other all over the world, was based on a theft, what would happen? What would the mere reflection of the emergent complex behavior of society look like? Mm. That's what you're seeing in the world today. So uh, another thing that I've heard Milton Friedman say is, and I've said this before on this podcast, is that uh, inflation is the silent tax of society. You know, that uh, the government can raise taxes or they can just continue to inflate the economy through printing money. Uh, it it's, doesn't cost votes to do so. That's that's exactly why they get away with it. And when right. they say get, they get away with it, you, you keep in mind you wouldn't vote for anything different. Right. Right. And so so when you think about this government, this opaque in, industry, think about the people that elect the government. If somebody said to you, somebody said, a politician said, we're going to stop printing money, every bank's going to collapse, and and all prices are going to collapse, and, and, um, and, and you're going to have to make it on your own. Would you vote that politician? In? No. So, so again, you want to believe the lie. Mm-hmm. You want to believe there's a free lunch, and you'll vote for the person that says, "Here's your free lunch. Mm-hmm. Here's how good. It, here's how much money we're going to make up for you." Yeah. And and so and that comes from a and that cost to society. We all bear that cost, and right. that cost enriches some people. If you own twenty houses, your price of your house, it, the house price isn't isn't going up. The money is going down, but the house stores its value better than the money. Mm. And so if other people are renting that house, their rents are going up in yep. relation to uh, uh, relation to the house. So a bit of a doomsday talk here. It, from the existing system, unfortunately, it is a doomsday. Is there, there's no way around it. There is no way out from the existing system. Unfor- uh, unfortunately, what, what typically happens at this point in the cycle from, an, from a system like this is it, to, to be elected, you have to divide society, one part of society against the other. And once you get elected, to stay elected, you have to create an enemy outside of your, your country. Mm-hmm. And that's why the world goes to war to right. be able to re- reset uh, systems like this. And so, so that's actually also why I've become a, quite a Bitcoin advocate is because this system can't change itself and we wouldn't vote that system to change itself. Um, we're too, uh, 
we would never sacrifice our personal no, uh, on mass. We would never sacrifice our uh, our personal wealth or enough of us to be able to vote a system based on truth. Yeah. So, so you needed a you needed a, a, a something outside of the system to be a bridge to the other side to transition it. So, what do you say to someone who's like, okay, well, that's great, Jeff. Like, you're successful. You sold half a million books. You've sold you've sold companies. You've made money you've done well in your life but this is just this is just the type of thing that rich people talk about who don't have anything else to do and you know what i mean like you know what do you say to that or what do you say to the person who's like well that's just conspiracy theories like that's not real life like my life is fine everything's going well i'm in debt a bit but it's not that bad yeah so if they're in debt a bit that means uh that they're expecting so the the way the system works today is you take on debt hoping to repay that debt with cheaper money tomorrow that's mm-hmm. actually why you take on so much debt, because the because the real cost of the debt goes down as you get wages through the uh, through through the world, and that means um, that that means the people with access to the most debt, if you have access to a little bit of debt, then you can do better than the person without access to the debt. You're ta- effectively that system is taking from other people and giving to you, and if you have access like BlackRock to the most debt. Mm-hmm they're taking the money from you. So so the rich in the system get wealthier and wealthier and wealthier. Actually, probably an easier way to see it is a game of Monopoly. Mm-hmm. So a game of Monopoly, you go around the board, and every time you go around the board, you get $200. And on with luck, you land on the right squares, and if you collect the houses at the right time, it creates an incentive, a positive incentive for you. You get rents on those houses, and then you could build hotels. And it creates a negative incentive for somebody else. They have to pay more of their 200 as they go around the board to you. Mm-hmm. And eventually that game resets. Somebody takes all the money or the game board is kicked over because people get so mad. Right. <laughs> right? Yeah, yeah. And, and you start anew. What if that game couldn't reset? What if, what if you were stuck in that per, uh, perpetual loop of that game and the people that own the real estate around the board then said, well, let's give those people that are losing $300 instead of $200. What would happen is all of the prices of of the rents and food and everything else around the board would just increase in price. Mm -hmm. And then those people couldn't get around the board. And then people would say, well, why don't we give them $400? That's the system we live in. And it's creating perpetual slavery, essentially modern day slavery for large portions of the population. Now, if you said, so th- that is a fact, and it's fact all over the world. And so that's why rich are getting richer and poor are getting poorer, because the system is designed that way. But what would the poor vote for? If you're around that mon- monopoly board and you're out of money and you can't pay your bills, you're liable to say, I'll take $300. Of course, yeah. Right? Of course. Instead of $200. That's what I want. My short-term interests, I, I, I live in such fear that I can't see the long-term uh, and, and negatives of that game. Mm-hmm. So I'll take the short term. Yeah. So they vote for more short term, which make, makes it worse. Now, if you're in in Africa or or South America, it's it's that much worse in some of the, these countries. And it and and when you have a system essentially based on fraud at the, at the core, then the people who abuse that system rise to power. Mm-hmm. And they advan- take advantage uh, f- uh, further. And so that's the system we live in today. And Bitcoin is exactly the opposite system. It's a system based on truth. So one thing you say um, on the front of your book is you say, um, why deflation is the key to an abundant future. So right now, inflation is what we believe is a key to an abundant future. And you are going to say it's actually the opposite of that. Um, so I'd like, to, I'd like to you to maybe kind of break down two things. So why is that the case and how does that actually happen? So, so abundance and money. So it, 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 and, and some of these concepts, even though we live in this crazy time, we, we have a, this short-term bias and measurement. Right. And we think our world is what it always looks like. So we, we don't question the, the, our, our, our world very, very often. And, and so... Why is inflation required for a productive economy? Is should be the a, a more important question. Okay. Right? Like, why would that? Yeah. Why would theft in money be required? Right. 
to trade with each other all over the world. Does it make does it does that make sense? And and what you what you find um, there, and I've been quoted all often on this: abundance and money creates scarcity everywhere. Okay. Scarcity and money creates abundance. You say that again. Abundance and money creates scarcity. Scarcity and money creates abundance. Right. And and the why is if you could have solved a world abundance by printing more monetary units of paper, don't you think in the last 5,000 years we would have solved that problem? Yeah. I mean, right. it, logically, that would make sense, right? We would have already worked through this problem. We would problem. have already figured a yeah. way, a way to solve that problem. So when you can't, when, when you can't, pr- you can't print energy, right? Yes. And so if you keep on making up more and more units of money to pretend you can print energy, conservation of energy, <laughs> right? Yeah. The, then what ends up happening is, is that that creates misallocation of capital and a whole bunch of pain downstream. And, and so, and scarcity of money drives the exact opposite. Mm-hmm. What we do is when things are scarce, we find ways around and create, uh, create, uh, um, uh, we create efficiency, which makes our lives better. Okay. Um, and so, you know, I use the example on the calculator app, right? On, on your, on your phone. Why is that free? And there's a lot of people who would believe falsely that it's free because of, uh, because of advertising and it's not free because of advertising. It's free because, um, it's free because the prices fall to the marginal cost of production. Mm-hmm. And because when there's probably 50, 75 calculators or apps competing for your attention mm-hmm. And I, I run a venture capital company. And if somebody came up to me and said, I have a really great idea for a calculator app, you would say, how are you going to make money on that when they're all free? Yeah. And, and that's what you find. So that's why and the marginal cost of production of a calculator app is zero. Right. So that's why it's free. Yeah. And w- when you see things like chat GPT or open AI and, ar- and artificial intelligence and where we are going with these things, the marginal cost of production of a lot of this stuff is free. Yeah, it's going to zero. So, so that means entrepreneurs, until it gets to zero, while well, you can make a penny, entrepreneurs all over the world will try to create more money by making a penny. And then when one says, here, I can make it for two cents, another one will say one cent. Mm-hmm. And as that happens, as they, as they remove more jobs with the technology, it falls to free. Yeah. And, 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 and so there's these concepts in, um, in economics that are completely divorced from the reality of the world, and we don't question them. So why is the air you breathe free? Mm-hmm. Right? Yeah. Because it's abundant. Yeah. And abundance creates free. So wh- how did you uh, start this line of thinking? Was this, did, did, did exploration into Bitcoin bring no. you down this road? No. Was uh, Bitcoin a solution to a problem that you already saw? So I saw the problem first, and I saw the problem in, in I was creating technology companies. And my first technology company cost uh, almost $5 million to create uh, a, a logistics technology that today is free. Mm. And, and, and I think about all of the people that I hired to do that, to code that, and now you have technology creating code, right? Where one piece of technology that it would literally take 30 seconds for open AI to refactor yeah. the code yeah. took my team of 50 people um, three months to do one <laughs> tiny piece <laughs> and meetings and all right. and, the, to be, and, and, and this, to, uh, this can refactor it in 30 seconds. So when you realize that power and, and what I, so what I couldn't understand, and this is what, what I couldn't understand is if I was seeing that everywhere, in my businesses and technology was moving exponentially and it wasn't just in my business technology was base layer in everything it was it was in oil production it was in energy production it was everywhere then why were we only seeing technology pr- or prices fall in consumer electronics why wasn't ev- everywhere and what you real and what i realized is as they started to fall as prices would fall we had too much debt we were in a debt trap and the debt couldn't be allowed to reset because the debt was the entire system. Mm. And so if you allowed that, if you, if you allowed that to happen, if you allowed prices to fall exponentially, which would free our time exponentially, 
Yes, you would get paid less each year as prices fell more, but you would get more for what you buy. Right. Eat, and it would continue. Versus the other system, I realized that the existing system that we were in had to manipulate money at an exponential rate to offset the 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 product productivity that should be flowing to society. So that's when I decided, and I I talked about this for probably six years, maybe ten years before I wrote the book. Mm. Um, if you were a friend of mine, cultist campfire. You were tired of me talking about it. <laughs> They're like, oh, here he goes yeah, again. Exactly. Jeff's talking about <laughs> inflation. Be, because nobody wants to face the ugly truth. They want to, it's just easier to just accept, here's the system I live in. I, I'm going to make enough money to just escape myself yeah. without the consequence of what that would do to the world. I so. guess it's really hard to look at this as like, you know, a regular guy with some kids and figure out like, how can we escape this? So like. So is there a way? Is there a way out? Yeah. So that's why I became so. So that was the problem. I I'm an entrepreneur. I'm constantly if I see a problem, especially a big problem like this, I want to solve it. I can't. I can understand how bad it's going to get. I have to understand. Okay, if this is going to happen, what's going to happen next? What's going to happen next? What's it? And and that book lays out laid out what's happened. Right. If you read that book, it was written in 2019 it lays out exactly what's happened before us and it's accelerating. So I needed to know at a first principles basis what was going to happen and how bad that would get. And then I spent all my time, what could a solution look like? Mm. And, and that's when, and in that book, there's one paragraph on Bitcoin. Mm -hmm. And yes, I had bought Bitcoin before, but a very little bit. Okay. Um, and, and I thought it uh, was one potential solu solution, yeah. or it might be a potential solution. But as I saw uh, governments ramp up the printing press in response to COVID, I realized there is no way out of the existing system. And I have many contacts in governments all over the world, and I was advocating for a different approach uh, before that. But I realized the inertia of the existing system, it's just too, too powerful. Uh, inertia of the existing system it had to be changed from the outside in and so then i went on a deep dive a real deep dive of bitcoin and and to be able to to actually transition from a system today that we live in that's ten thousand times bigger than bitcoin mm -hmm. it would have to be decentralized and secure it would be have to withstand every attack vector possibly yeah. possible and it would have to it would have to be a lot more than people think it is. Mm. So I went I spent a lot of time to to say what would this look like and then what would the outcome of that system what would that do to for humanity versus the system we're in. Mm. And that's when I decided to to start investing in the space uh, more uh, uh spending way more time in the space. It sounds like you need to update the book. <laughs> to include more chapters about Bitcoin. Yeah. So w it was after you wrote this that you really kind of became a Bitcoin maximalist. Is that right? Yeah, yeah, that's right. Is it, is, it, is it accurate to say that you're a Bitcoin maximalist? It is accurate. Okay. So um, when, when, when we say you're a Bitcoin maximalist, I find that that means different things to different people. Like some people are like, well, I don't own any real estate anymore. Like I, like everything, my whole life, everything I have is in Bitcoin, every investment. Uh, are you in that extreme? No. So what 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 is it? What is a Bitcoin maximalist to you? So Bitcoin maximalist to me is, I fundamentally do not think there will be another altcoin or blockchain. Okay. I fundamentally think they are all going to zero. Yeah. And I can tell you why, um, structurally why, and I can and I can talk about the network effects that are happening on top of that, and saying where would I? So if I'm going to invest somewhere or invest my time, my most valuable resource, I want to spend a bunch of time to make sure. I'm not investing in a Ponzi scheme. Yeah. I'm not investing in just what somebody else thinks is great. I want to understand fun, first principles, why this could change the world. Okay. The, and, and so that's why I'm a Mac, maximalist. So I've heard um, other um, writers like maybe Robert Kiyosaki, Ray Dalio, they kind of have a similar type of narrative. The financial system is going to collapse and end in war. Yeah. You know, um, is it, do you draw uh, inspiration from those guys? Do you talk to those guys about this type of stuff? Like, w where does this line of thinking ultimately 
ultimately come from? Because there certainly is kind of a theme um, in, I'm, I'm not sure, I, I kind of want to call you a philosopher, um, you know, in people who are, who, are, who are laying out a line of thinking for us here. Yeah, so, so Ray Dalio and his team had my book before it was released. Okay. So uh, uh, Robert Kiyosaki, I've been on his podcast twice. He uh, he compared me to he said it was a crazy great compliment. But he compared uh, a friend of his was Buckminster Fuller. Okay. And he and he compared me to Buckminster Fuller. Right. Um, and but really, what it so yes, I'm so I understand their views on where things mm-hmm. go. Um, Ray Dalio, he, because he doesn't understand technology. Mm-hmm. He thinks it's going to reset with China winning, right? And and, yeah. and 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 if you didn't understand Bitcoin, actually, I could understand that take, right? Um, the um, I suspect with technology, it changes that take, okay. take as well. And we've never seen we've never seen something that is decentralized and secure, sure, in in human history. Yeah, we always had to trust centralization. And then we've created laws to protect ourselves from the centralization. So how do we get around this lack of scalability? When we look at the trilemma, we mm-hmm. say, well, it's slow, so, whatever. Yeah. How do we get around that? So, so the, uh, perfect. So, so, so to be able to, and, and that's where you have to look at scaling and layers. Mm-hmm. So in, in TCP IP, which is layer one of the internet, was created by DARPA in this late 60s. And it wasn't until 1989. Now think about how much l- longer that was. Right. And nothing exists, and you can't even see what's on top of it, going to exist until the next layer is there. Okay. That the next layer can can create that create more value. So HTTP uh, by Tim Berners Lee wasn't until 1989. And if you asked people what the internet would do, which powers the phone and everything else we're doing right now, yeah. <laughs> uh, works in 1989. How many people thought it would do what it does today? Yeah, of course. Right. And that that was after four layers, right? That wasn't TCP IP. <laughs> that was, uh, um, and so that's what, what's happening with Bitcoin. Bitcoin, you could say, the people saying it's old tech are misinterpreting what it is. And so the Bitcoin or the blockchain trilemma, um, scalability, so scalability, decentralization, and, and security. security. Yeah, pick th- pick two of three. So Bitcoin picked uh, uh, it was designed for decentralization and and security, and you could argue that it's been very successful at that. Mm-hmm. Fair, definitely, right? Yeah, but by doing so, it 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 was designed to only do five to seven transactions per second, so it can't scale. So now imagine in a market that's being manipulated by money, um, that. A bunch of people that invested in this, call it pristine bearer asset, and and it started growing a, a lot in price, created a whole bunch of value for those people, and it was decentralized and secure, but it couldn't do anything else. Yeah, what would that do to a market? Right, it would create a market that would say, "That's old tech," and I'm going to create this new blockchain that's going to do new things, and it would and and. And it would create a whole bunch of ways to tell the world that I'm going to create the new, the new Bitcoin, Bitcoin's old tech. Um, but they would have to, because of the blockchain trilemma, they would have to sacrifice either security. And if they sacrifice security, I'm sure nobody wants to run their blockchain or their NFT or anything else yep. on something that's insecure. Yep. Those fail, right? And if they sacrifice uh, uh, se- decentralization for centralization, you would never run a blockchain. You'd it's run just a too database. inefficient. Yeah, you'd run a database. So how could you have DeFi on top of a centralized blockchain? And some of the things that people don't even question. <laughs> um, and then if you if you have a centralized blockchain and it costs a bunch of money on a centralized blockchain and somebody else is in control of the rules and you own a whole bunch of NFTs on those, if the blockchain fails, all of those fail. Right. Right. And and so, but I do understand why a market grew to abuse and conflate the differences between Bitcoin and everything else because Bitcoin couldn't scale. So if you were in, in, in Bitcoin in the beginning, the only thing you could do is tell how great a piece of, or great an asset it was, but it couldn't do anything else. And then layer two comes on. And layer two lightning today um, is, it brings unlimited transaction speed 
effectively. And every 10 minutes, it comes back down to the first layer. Mm -hmm. So it doesn't sacrifice the decentralization and security. And it gains speed, um, it gains speed uh, another, uh, on, on another layer. Fediment, one of the country er, co company, Fedi, that one of the com uh, companies that we invested in in EgoDeath, is a two and a half or th layer three technology that gives more functionality. Mm. And so, what you're seeing, what I'm seeing, in this in this layering approach to Bitcoin, is a network effect exploding, both on the base layer, but people are, I would say, people are thinking a bit about Bitcoin as one thing, mm -hmm. right, instead of a network effect on the pristine bearer asset that turns into a neutral reserve currency around the world. And then on top of that network effect of growing value as entrepreneurs are building on top of that to utilize that base layer that's super secure yeah. through other layers. So, um, I mean, I've, I've experienced this firsthand. I, I've, so I've got three kids and um, we live on uh, right near the beach, on the beach, and uh, they have a lemonade stand. Yeah. So I put a accepting Bitcoin sign on the lemonade stand, partially for an exercise, partially to see would anyone <laughs> pay with yeah. Bitcoin. And, yeah. and uh, that's a good deal if you can. Yeah. yeah. And so, yeah. So my kids, um, you know, they, they each have a wallet. Uh, it's all on my phone, but they each have a wallet. And, and if someone comes and, and people will pay with Bitcoin yeah. when they see that, they get really excited. And, and they'll pay a lot of money for lemonade if they can actually use their Bitcoin. They get pretty excited about it and they want to take a picture and everything like that. But the simplicity of the process is great. You know, it's very, very fast and um, and efficient and cheap to do this, and uh, and and I find the whole experience of uh, of using Bitcoin in this way to be great. Uh, so you know that, and the majority of people that are talking about Bitcoin don't even know that, right? Right. So the mo majority of people, majority of people accepting uh, Visa transactions or using Visas right now don't realize that the, the, the vendor pays a two and a half of or course, three percent fee. Which is a lot of money. Which is a lot of money. And that fee is built into the price that they pay. Yep. And now on Bitcoin, for a fraction of a penny, you can send value anywhere in the world. Yeah. And more and more vendors are starting to accept Bitcoin because they, they make a whole bunch more money when that, ha when that happens. And more and more people are using that. And that's what I'm talking about, a network effect. Yeah. Every node, every person all over the globe that is doing that is creating value that is bypassing an existing system that's extracting value and they're creating more value for themselves and their families. Mm -hmm. And that's why it's unstoppable because it makes it stronger. So every new person that adds it in, in North America, we would look around and we said, there's not enough people accept this yet. Mm -hmm. So we wouldn't use it. Yeah. Right. But in Africa or South America, that's changing radically fast because there's such an incentive to use it. So this is exploding because it's a fraction of a penny to send value anywhere in the world. So what do you say to the people who say, but it's too volatile? Um, they're talking again, they're talking about the pristine bearer asset. Um, they're not talking about the network okay. on, to, on top of it. If the volatility nobody cares about on, um, on top of it, and you can transfer it in and out of US dollars or any currency you want. But more so than that is when people are measuring Bitcoin, through the existing system that it has manipulation in it, they're, they're, they're measuring Bitcoin through the error code. So what is Bitcoin priced in Venezuelan Boulevard or Turkish Lira, mm -hmm. where you're having massive infla inflation or, or in Egypt today where you're, you're revaluing currency? Bitcoin is more stable than some of these currencies. Right. And, and so what's, what's actually happening is you have a system today that people are living in and especially in North America, where, where, where they're used to stable financial systems, and, uh, and, and so they don't see that the new system is replacing this system. So what's happening, what if you actually measure prices in Bitcoin instead of the dollar value of Bitcoin in your currency, yeah. what you'll find is the thesis of my book will hold true in Bitcoin forever. Okay. In other words, prices will fall forever in Bitcoin. Right. Instead of instead of thinking Bitcoin's going up in price. Yeah. Prices are going prices down. Prices are going down against Bitcoin. Yeah, and I guess that is a. It's very difficult to. I, I think it's maybe simple enough to understand that in the moment, but it's difficult to think like that. Yeah. Because obviously, our whole system is built the opposite way. Right. Or we're we're taught the opposite way. Um, I've always been really interested in. Austrian School of Economics. Um, I want to know what do you think like 
Hayek or von Mises or Menger, what would they have thought if they were around today and Bitcoin was a thing? What would they have thought of Bitcoin? They would all be they would all be Bitcoiners. I'm I'm convinced Henry Ford would have been a Bitcoiner. Buckminster Fuller would have been a Bitcoiner. All of these people talked about the perfect money would be an energy money, right? Um, but it was infeasible at that time to be able to create an energy energy money. Yeah, and and so you had to have money outside of the manipulation of the state to be able to to allow the productive capacity. You'd have to have good money mm-hmm. to be able to allow the productivity yeah. product, productive capa- productivity capacity of humanity to flow to humanity. Okay, so uh, where do we get this kind of two percent inflation target that the governments? constantly talk about we're going to get back to two two percent we're going to get up to two percent like we're at eight percent but we're trying to get back to two percent where does this two percent come from and what what's the deal with the obsession of this number pick it out of thin air just w- just a w- random w- thing literally it is out of thin air and why is it out of thin air it's because because if somebody walked into your house and stole two percent of your stuff every year you wouldn't notice that's why oh interesting and when it turns into five percent you still might not notice. And yeah. when it goes to 8% or 10%, you go, where's my stuff? Yeah. That's what's happening to society right now. But the problem is it has to keep going higher it, because the, the debt is already insolvent. Yeah. It, it, and people need to just hear this over and over and over. The system they live in is insolvent. Yeah. And the only way to pretend it's solvent is to make your money lose value. So we live in a in a system where we're gamble where most people are gambling on which asset class that they can make more money, and they're forced to gamble at a higher and higher rate to try to save their money, which is losing value. So if you're prime minister, what do you do? So so you you transition a system. There's no way you ca- you can't let the system fail. Mm-hmm. So you have to con- you have to continue the system. Yeah. But you have to advocate for where the system is going. Okay. You have to, you have to, mo- so Kodak invented the digital camera, mm-hmm. right? And they're not around today. Yeah. Right. Even though they invented it. Yeah. And why? Because, and, and why? Because the digital camera destroyed the film business. Right. The film business was going to be destroyed anyways, is what I'm getting at. Technology changes where money comes mm. from. So if Kodak instead said, okay, this is this legacy business that's going away, where is the future going? Then they could have transitioned. They could have built a bridge to a new system that it, it took advantage of the very digital camera that they created. They could have created value elsewhere that would have valued, been a value to society. Instead, they collapsed by protecting. So if you looked at what's happening in all governments today and mo- most people today, what they're doing is protecting the system they yeah. live in yeah. and making it more and more unstable as they try to protect it where this is going to happen anyways. And so in, in an open protocol like Bitcoin, it doesn't matter what you do. You don't have to wait for your government. You don't have to wait for anybody. You, just have, you, can, you can walk across the bridge and start pricing your world into, into it. And, it and, and at, by doing that, you make that bridge wider for every other person that's, that can walk across the bridge. You're actually healing the world as you're as you as you're creating this new system do you think in bitcoin like you're going to go buy a new car you're buying a plane ticket you're like oh that's for bitcoin well, i do think i do, th- I, do, do. Think, I, I, I primarily think of it of the world it, price in bitcoin and and the and i do that because i i realize how hard it is for most people to break their mindset of if if the system we live in is 10,000 times bigger then then it's going to drive the majority of our attention and 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 we sit in the, we we sit in that system and we scream at that system thinking that somebody can solve that system yeah. for us. And we talk about different politicians. W- uh, this person's going left, right. It's all just theater. It's complete theater because you actually don't have a vote in a democracy. If the majority of the money comes from inflation and you don't have a vote in an inflation rate. <laughs> <right>? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> That's fair. <laughs> so, so it just be, it just becomes political theater that divides populations further and further and further, and and I and, and again I'm an entrepreneur. What I realize is I'm going to spend my time where it counts. I'm going to spend more of my time building the future that I, that, that I want to see, um, and yes, I'll do very well by building that future, 
um, but it'll also create a create a world that transitions to something that I believe provides truth, hope, and abundance. So, I've got a friend who's a Bitcoin maximalist, and he had told my son he he lives near us, and he said, "Hey, if you come over and weed my garden, I'll give you 400 satoshis." And then a couple of days later, he then kind of realized that 400 satoshis is like <laughs> nothing, 10 cents yeah, or something. Yeah. So this is a real practical problem. Like if if the Bitcoin maximalist can't even remember yeah. how much a Satoshi is worth, how is how is society going to function in a system? Because truthfully, it's confusing. You know, it's kind of hard to figure out how much is something worth unless you're a mathematician. Yeah, so, so let's just go back in time and forget. To, so how many people think about even, even if they even knew TCP, IP and all the layers of the internet? Yeah, nobody. Nobody. We think about the value we gain on top of this. Yeah. And so today what we're talking about right now in Bitcoin is the plumbing of Bitcoin versus the plumbing of the existing world. That's what we're talking about. And the value in, in the existing world, how many people know how much I know about how the Federal Reserve works, how, how the reserve currency of the world works, and how all the other currency? Very few people go down to that level. They l sit on top of that system and they think, here's the value I get out of the system, my job, my house, my here's my... And, and they don't think about how the systems run and creating more and more perverse outcomes for them. Nor do they think, what is the, the they don't spend their time in the system at the base level. And so what's happening today, we're so early in this transition that, that that's why it's hard and confusing because it operates totally different than the existing plumbing to, to, uh, to, new, uh, to new plumbing. And you have a build of it in entrepreneurs and build are building this new ecosystem on top of it that is going to deliver tons of value to society on top of this network mm. and they won't care right right they won't they won't care they, their life will just get be better and better think about the entrepreneurs too so what that means being an entrepreneur in this system what it mean uh, what it means is yes you could provide value and as you provide value, you'll make a bunch of money because people will use your technology if they use your technology or they, your product or service. But, but because prices continue to fall, fall, then you're going to have to create more value. Mm -hmm. You can't build, essentially you can't do what Google, Amazon, and, and a bunch of rent seekers do today, create massive monopolies mm -hmm. by pricing everybody else out. In an open system like this, it forces prices down for every. It, they just keep falling. So the world benefits as a result of that happens. Yes, entrepreneurs are going to win more of that. The people that are creating value for other people are going to win more of that value, just like any free market should work. But the output of the value creation creates value for all of society. So if you were um, raising little kids, and, and maybe you are. But uh, if you're raising little kids, which I am, which is why I'm asking this question, how are you going to teach them about money? How are you going to teach them about uh, kind of engaging in the current system and maybe what the system is going to look like? I, first principles. So a lot of, I do have three kids and we talk a lot about this, obviously, because I... Talk, <laughs> seems so to be your thing. Seems, seems to be my thing. <laughs> thing. Seems to be, I've been thrust into this uh, position. <laughs> but, but I had talked about the Why? And I and I'm not scared to ask a question that might that, that that might rub people the wrong way if it's if it's based on why why is inflation required right why do we accept that why why is there, and some people will say well if you don't have inflation people won't spend their money but let's dig a little deeper than that because I, I understand but some people listening to this podcast will say that then and what you're saying by that statement is. If you don't have theft in money, people don't won't spend their money. I don't believe that's true. Like, I still will buy food. I still buy. I still buy things every year that would come down in price the next year. I still buy. I still. I bought TVs for the last twenty years. Right. That every year they get better. Yeah. Computers they get better. So it doesn't pass the test of what you would actually do. You buy something when it create when it hits a point of creating value for you. And that. And, and so we don't need to live in a system that is based on this. And so if you ask my, uh, what I teach my kids, I ask my kids to, to, to ask big questions 
and to not be and not be scared of where those questions take uh, take uh, take you. Keep on asking, and you can go the five whys. Right? Ask why. Ask why again. Ask why again. Right. Is, and you'll get down to the sand. You'll get down to the real truth, and then you can make a better decision. Mm. Um, I think that's I think that's that's fascinating. So it's it's not that you're necessarily even teaching your kids. Uh, wh- what you're teaching your kids is just to continually ask questions and to learn and to dig deeper and to look behind the curtain and to peel the onion and yeah. to continue to, to look. Yeah. Because, because e- even if you think about, if I, and I've done this for myself, I do this for me. Why do you want this much money? Right. right. You actually don't want money. You want with the belief system of what you think the money will get by you. Yeah. Right? You might, you want the safety for your family, a vacation, a, a, a hope, it's not the money that you want it, it, itself. It's e- uh, even on that why. Why do you do something? It's you, you're doing it for a different, you might be doing it for a different reason. And so what I, what I want for my kids, I could care less what they do. I want them to find the life that they want to find. Mm. Okay, I want to ask you a very specific Bitcoin question. So, um, you know, in a couple of years, we're going to move into another year of Bitcoin halving. Um, we have maybe 100 years of Bitcoin mining left before the last uh, Bitcoin is mined. Um, what happens at that point? You know, when we get closer to that, what happens to the Bitcoin network and what happens to the miners when there's no more Bitcoins to mine or a very, very small portion of Bitcoins to mine? Yeah, so when you're, when you're talking about that, it's actually, you know you know the answer. It's over 100 years. It's 118 years or 117 yeah. years away. So 2140, when the last Bitcoin's uh, mined. Now, assume we get to a system that allows the product productivity uh, of our planet to be able to distribute uh, to to all of us. I almost don't even care because we'll be living in a different system by then, mm. and humanity won't even realize that they ever put up in a system with a, with the other system. Right. It'll be a new it'll be a new system. Now, I if you ask specifically, then at that time, twenty one forty probably through lightning fees or through other uh, other fees in the network there's money to be able to make make in the network but the whole point of it is in that network prices fall forever right. so let's take something that's going to happen way before 2140 artificial general intelligence right where where you have where you have robots and machines that are smarter than all of us mm-hmm. right so let's say that might be 10 years away 20 years away 30 years away 40 years ago away. can you imagine living in a system that takes all that productivity and concentrates it up on one or two people, right? In an, that's the system we live in today, mm-hmm. it, or in a very small group of people. That means that everybody else in the world pretending to, to try to make enough money in that system is actually modern day slavery, mm. right? For who's sitting on top of the AI models, right? Because, because in that system, you would realize that Okay, if s- computers and I- and robots are merging, and robots could be in any shape, size, anything else, yeah. they could do anything better than us, right? Where is our labor, and where is the price of things if they should fall to free? And so we need a system like Bitcoin that allows that productivity to flow to us, so that we're not in a dystopian world. Mm. Once we're in that system. I think we'll make better decisions in what the, that that looks like. Why didn't Satoshi start with twenty one million Bitcoin, and and burn coins as time progresses versus starting with none and and creating them as time progresses? Uh, w- would that have changed things? Like if yeah, it was deflationary? It, um, yeah, probably. Probably it would have changed the the game theory of how mining works to be able to 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 uh, to chase. Stranded yeah. energy, stranded and abundant energy. Because a whole other piece of Bitcoin is it creates energy abundance by by proof of work chasing stranded energy all over the world. Proof of work is certainly controversial. So how do we get around this like this narrative that Bitcoin is destroying the environment? Now, like even in our own province, you're not allowed to create new Bitcoin miners because we're now limited in that way. Yeah, so it, 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 again... <laughs> These narratives, that's why you have to ask why and why again mm-hmm. and why again. Number w- the, the highest level in the narrative. 
what would a system designed on theft that if a new system emerged the people that were hurt by that system what would it try to do to stop that new system Mm -hmm. it would say anything do anything right right? and and the the more money you made from the existing system the more incentive you would have to be able to to try to stop the new of course right that's when I, i talk about why this is so it was so important at the design principles that was outside the system and unstoppable by the system so that's 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 what proof of work is um but but now let's ask the why on energy everything let's use bc hydro as an example so cities tend to centralize and you need to centralize power to make make sure you run run the city mm-hmm. so when you build the when when uh, when when you built site c then to pay for site c you had to actually turn off all of the other energy all of the uh, all of the sawmills, all the, the uh, second party uh, private uh, 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 private dams that were supplying B, uh, BC Hydro Energy. Mm-hmm. Because if you didn't, energy price was too cheap and you couldn't pay for Site C Dam. Okay. So in other words, we already have energy abundance. Mm-hmm. And it's a pricing mechanism to protect pricing and, and a capitalist type, type of system that is keeping energy high price Mm. and bitcoin mining it doesn't matter where that energy is it could be volcanoes in uh in el salvador Mm -hmm. it could be a bitcoin miner uh, off a river it could be anywhere and you can actually decentralize energy um and clean up the environment methane flaring Mm -hmm. um, uh, producing uh producing energy but it comes at a at a cost of the centralized entity for energy and and that centralized ener- energy system um, requires it to make efficient capital decisions to be able to to keep the lights on for the entire city you, so what's happening in bitcoin mining it, it, it bc it doesn't matter if uh, to bitcoin at all if bc it matters to bc if right it, it matters it, to bc it yeah. matters to bc a lot because they're making terrible decisions yeah but it doesn't matter to bitcoin at all uh, in in africa bitcoin miners are popping up all over the place um you, you can right now uh, want, uh, mine bitcoin at two cents uh, uh, uh sorry two cents a kilowatt hour in um in in africa and it's exploding in different places uh, because of that, because it's chasing about uh, it's chasing energy. And by the way, by doing so, it's also electrifying Af- Africa, because the extra energy from that is building into small villages, right? That wouldn't have actually been able to create energy yeah. unless you had a, a buyer of energy moving into yeah. that energy. Wow, um, can you tell us? In your opinion, aside from El Salvador, where is the most uh, Bitcoin-friendly place in the world to see maybe adoption happen? Uh, I no, I haven't been there yet, but but I but know lots of people that have um, all over Africa. It's exploding, mm-hmm. and so so we're doing a lot of investing there too. Really, um, and, uh, and and some of the talent is just uh, it's incredible. So is this really a, a is this because? Uh, there's limited government regulation, limited government control. Is it because no? It's the it's it's the opposite. There's lots of lots of government trying to control it. There are lots of CBDCs. Yeah, it's more of a need uh, there. Right. So if you just think about a monopoly power, mm-hmm. um, Kodak was an example. But any monopoly, the people furthest away from the monopoly are most hurt. Mm. So today in the monopoly of money, U.S., Euro, Canada, Canada, Japan we're closer to the money printer. We're closer to the monopoly of money. Mm-hmm. Other countries, if, if, they're, if their money is priced in your money, then they're at the whim. They're the yeah. so, 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 the, so the people furthest away from the mon- money monopoly have been most hurt for the longest. And now you have a technology, just like all technology, most technology is bottom-up disruption mm-hmm. instead of top-down. And so now you have a bottom-up disruption of technology. And the only difference is this time it's coming for money. So it makes total sense that El Salvador would go first because prior to El Salvador going first, it was the world's highest crime rate. Mm. 
and that came, that crime came out of dystopian conditions around money. The same thing is happening in many African countries, and now people are moving first. And if their government isn't moving, they'll move first. Right. It doesn't. It's, it doesn't matter. It's open to anybody to to access the network. So, is it fair to say so the people farthest away from like centralized currencies have been most hurt, uh, and now they are because they're able to get close to Bitcoin. They and and everybody is. Everybody kind of has an equal chance at being part of the economy now. Talent. Uh, um, talent is globally distributed evenly. Mm. Opportunities were not right. Bitcoin changes that. Okay. Bitcoin makes uh, uh, talent. Uh, I can attract talent. I can pay people in Bitcoin anywhere in the world, wherever they are, and it opens up ta- that talent pool to anywhere uh, to all o- all over the world. So it yeah. opens up opportunities. Yeah. And so where people are most uh, didn't have opportunities, and they understand this network, they've just exploded their opportunities. So is it fair to say being against Bitcoin is being against equal opportunity? I would say. Yeah, I, I, I would say, I, I don't know. So, I, I would ask, why does somebody believe that uh, that that the world should work on a theft, and then who wins by that theft and who loses by that theft? And if they were they're able to question that openly, logically, both sides of that, why should it work like that? And what would the world look like if it was based on truth? Because all it is just an no, it's just it's a ledger, right? At least mm-hmm. in the base, base layer, it's just a ledger of, of truth. What would the world look like in both those scenarios? And if you advocate for the world be- based on theft, then then just know what you're building. Yeah. Right. Know yeah. what n- know what's coming next based based on that because it gets worse. Yeah. And so uh, I, if people could, I know it's hard because you don't believe your world is based on that. I never did either. I believed I'm an entrepreneur, a free market. It's all me. I work harder than everybody else. I should get more. It wasn't until I d- dug deeper on this that how rigged the game is for some people versus others that I that I really started to say, wait, the, the game's going to break anyways. How are we going to set reset the global game to something that benefits everybody? Yeah, that's great. Okay, I think we're going to leave it there. Uh, I'm not sure I can handle much more. <laughs> this is this is super inspiring and and uh, and really educational. I really enjoyed learning more about kind of the bigger picture of the economy and how how Bitcoin can can have a part to play or really be part of revolutionizing the broken, back driven system that we live in. So I really appreciate your time being with me here today, Jeff. Anytime, thanks. Thank you.